Good morning and welcome to chapter 3. This is section 3.1 and it has to do with exponential and logarithmic functions and today we're going to be looking at exponential functions and their graphs. I'm going to skip over this important vocabulary for a second um, and just try to give you a context for where exponential functions fit into everything. So so far we've been looking at polynomial functions and then we looked at rational functions. Those are all examples of algebraic functions. We can use algebra to solve them and a lot of the techniques that we saw in algebra 2. The exponential function f with base a is donated, denoted by, um, let's see, base a so f of x equals a to the x, where a is greater than 0, a does not equal 1, and x is any real number. And that is an example of a transcendental function. Transcendental is going to be your exponential, and then the inverse of the exponential, which is the logarithm. And form of the word that we would use as logarithmic functions. So for example one, we're just going to take and evaluate this expression 5 to the 3 fifths power. So um, why is this an exponential? Well we have a base which is 5 and an exponent which is x. So if we want to raise I don't have my graphing calculator, so I just want to tell you the keystrokes that you would use for that. You're going to use your, um, it looks like a caret, right above the division symbol. And then whenever we do fractions, we want to make sure we put them in parentheses. So 5 to the 3 fifths power, and I'm going to use my basic TI here. So I just get a pretty big decimal and I'm going to round that to two places, so 2.63. So now we need to talk about the graphs of exponential functions and that's going to get us into a discussion of um, the growth and decay and also probably going to get into transformation of functions. So for a is greater than 1, is the graph of f of x equals a to the x increasing or decreasing over its domain? So when a is greater than 1, this is the growth curve and so as x goes from left to right we're going to be increasing. For a is greater than 1 is the graph of g of x equals a to the negative x increasing or decreasing over its domain. So that's where we have to think about what does a negative exponent mean and um, say I pick a value of a as 2. If I do 2 to the x, so I'm going 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, I can see that that's increasing. So for a is greater than 1, so that's the 2 value. If I'm going to be choosing x values, so say I still choose x as 1, 2, and 3, but to get my function, I'm going to plug in uh, 2 to the negative 1. Well, what is that? That's a half. 2 to the negative 2 is a fourth. 2 to the negative 3, that's an eighth. So that's actually going down. So when I have a negative exponent, I'll be decreasing. So for the graph of y equals a to the x or y equals a to the negative x, a is greater than 1. The domain is, um, we can plug anything in. The domain is all real numbers and the range is going to be from 0 to infinity. 
the intercept well that's where I need you guys to think about what happens if X is 0 what is any number a to the 0 power anything to the 0 power is always 1 so no matter what your a value is you're going to intersect at 0, 1. So let's see. Both graphs have the x-axis. So I think it's time to take a look at the graphs of the exponential functions. Those can be found on page 182. But I'm actually going to use this graph to graph the parent functions. So here I I have a table of values already that contains some some values from the um, f of x equals a to the negative x. So let me do a few more. I've got 0, 1, and let's see what happens if I put in a negative 1. So then I'm doing, um, and actually this is if a was 2. So 2 to the negative, negative 1 is 2 to the 1, so that's 2. So you can see like here is your, your higher over here on the left, 2 to the negative 2 is 4, and then here at 1, that's where we get into a half, and then a fourth, and then an eighth. So this is the negative curve. It has the x-axis as an asymptote. So I'm going to say f of x equals a to the negative x. And that'll be my curve that's in blue. And then I'm going to go ahead and do f of x equals 2 to the x over here in pink. And so let me go ahead and plot some points. 2 to the negative 2 is a fourth, 2 to the negative 1 is a half, 2 to the 0 is 1, 2 to the 1 is 2, 2 to the 2 is 4. So you can kind of see that these graphs are inverse of each other. They both still have this y-intercept in common. 2 to the 1 and 2 to the 2. So you can see the pink one is growing with a positive exponent and the blue one is decreasing as we go from left to right. So to graph the function 3 to the negative x, I am going to find some graph paper. I'll be right back with you. Okay, so to graph the function 3 to the negative x, I'm going to go ahead and create my x-axis and my y-axis. And I'm just going to plot a few key points. So I'm going to do this table of values sideways here. So always the most simple point for me to plug in is 0 because 3 to the 0 equals 1. So a lot of your exponential graphs are going to have that in common until you start transforming them and moving them up, down, left, right. Um, but anything to the 0 power is 1. So let me plug in a positive 1, and 3 to the negative 1 equals a third. And then plug in a 2, 3 to the negative 2 equals a ninth. So you can see how this is going to get really, really close to the axis right away. And then 3 to the negative, negative 1, which is 3 to the 1, equals 3. And then 3 to the negative 2 that's going to equal 3 squared, which is 9. So that's up here somewhere. So you can see these curves, they all follow the same pattern. All right, last but not least, we have this natural base E. The natural um, exponent base, I don't actually want to spend a ton of time on where it comes from because we're mostly going to use it by using the E button in your calculator. But the way the 
the number e is arrived at is through this function right here. So this would be, I don't know, this is something, I'm not sure why we use e. I think we're going to find that that's more obvious once we get into our logarithm section. But for now, I want you to just practice using, you know, find your E button on your calculator, and it's usually somewhere near your natural log button. So on my little calculator here, you can see here's the log, here's the natural log, and then I've got E to the X right here. So if I want to do E to the 3 fifths power, oh, let's see. Let's see, three fifths. Okay, so doing it on my calculator isn't really going to help because I have to enter things in backwards on this calculator. So I had to enter in three fifths and then use the E button. But you should be able to use E and then use your power button and then three fifths. So to look at the graph of f of x equals e to the x, um, e is just a number that as, as x gets really, really big, you can figure out like it's an irrational number, so it never ends. Let's see, 271828128, but it goes on forever. So um, you don't want to have to enter that into your calculator every single time. But basically, if you were going to have e to the x, it's just a number between 2 and 3 that's going to the x power. So the graph of that function, e to the 0 is still equal to 1. And e to the 1 is equal to e. So 2.7 something. So you're still going to have this general growth exponential curve. And there's still, there's no value of x that you can't plug in for it. So the domain is going to be all reals. And the range is going to be the same as the general exponential function. So it's it's got an asymptote on the x-axis and it goes up towards infinity. So and the intercept is 1, and I just gave you the value of e here. So we use e a lot when we do interest problems, so I want to go through one of those for you now so that you can have the formulas, and we are going to talk about, um, in the old days, I think, I want to say before computers, so this is when I was a kid, they used to do an annual interest rate and then the bank would actually compound your interest for you like every month or every day or every quarter. And so um, that is the formula. Um, your balance A in the account is the principal, which is the amount you initially deposited. You take 1 plus the interest rate divided by however many compoundings per year there are, and then you raise it to the number times the number of years. So this is how they used to do it, but you'll still see some problems where it's compounded 4 times a year or 12 times a year, and you just have to plug that in for n. But now the formula is... Um, I don't want to say it's a more simple formula because it does require your knowledge of the natural base E, but if they're going to compound your interest continuously, which is what computers do nowadays, you're going to use this formula, A equals P E to the RT power. So we are going to um, do example four and we're going to compound monthly 
and we're going to compound continuously and we're just going to show the amount that would end up in the account. So I always, if I'm using a complicated formula, I recopy my formula and we're looking for the amount. So we're looking for A and the T is 10 years and the $6,000 is the initial amount and this one's going to be compounded monthly so that means n is 12 times a year the time is 10 years the um, principal is 6,000 the rate is 0.07 so you can see we are given all of the information 1 plus 0.07 divided by 12 and then 12 times 10 so we just need to plug in these numbers and we'll have our answer. So you're going to use parentheses kind of carefully. So I'm going to do uh, 1 plus 0.07 divide by 12 raised to the 120th power times 6,000. So that equals $12,057.97. $12,057.97. Okay, and then compounded continuously, I'm going to have my formula, and I want the amount, the principal is 6,000. E is just E rate times time, so that's 0 0.07 times 10, so, which is just 0.7. So I am going to do e to the 0 0.7 times 6,000, and you get 12,082 and 52 cents if I round. So you can see by compounding a little more frequently you earn and you didn't see any of that. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. Okay, here we go. Now you can pause this. So you can see when you compound continuously you earn a little bit more interest. So it's good for you as a consumer if you're going to put your money in a bank somewhere you want them to be compounding continuously. But um, the main thing for the banks is that not only do they pay interest to their customers, but they charge interest to their loan customers. So if you go and get a, and borrow money from the bank and you have a mortgage or you go out and buy a car, they're going to compound that interest continuously also. So they're going to be able to charge you more. That's, um, you know, it works both ways. So that is our lesson for 3-1. Thanks for watching.